Scotland as the training exercise, but we can use it elsewhere where people are trying to discuss organizing. So my name is Wade Bradley. I'm Chief Organizer of Acorn International. I'm going to stand here. So those of you who are sitting on the table to my back, I'm going to scooch you around a little bit so that uh, you're more comfortable. Or we've got you can have another table. You can spread out. Pretend it's the west. This is not going to be a lecture particularly. I'm going to go through a number of things about organizing and try to, between now and five, or whenever the whistle blows, give you as much information as I can about the kind of organizing I'm familiar with. And when we talk about community organizing, what we're really trying to talk about. Um, there are two ways that we're going to break this down. Between now and lunch, which is going to be around 1.30-ish, we're going to go through some principles of community organizing and how we look at the methodology of our work. And then this afternoon, after lunch, we're going to try to take those principles and some things about how campaigns work, strategy, tactics, and look at some uh, Edinburgh-based issues. And we're going to have a process where y'all and me are going to try to figure out how we would approach certain issues, how we set up the campaign, how we might figure out a way to win. And maybe that'll go well, and maybe it won't, but that's what we're all going to try to do. Okay? Anybody has a question, comment, something to say, just, you know, give me a hand, give me a signal, nod your head, twitch, something like that, and I'll pick it up. We all sort of speak English. Uh, mine not so well, because it's formed in the United States in the southern part of the country. Uh, Y'all means you all, uh, <laughs> you know, as opposed to yous or whatever you use here. I was getting some lecture on, you know, popular slang here in Scotland, so I now know two or three words for my friends. Uh, but it takes a while for your ears to understand me and for my ears to understand you, so take it slow with me, we'll get there. Let's start, okay? Any other questions before we get into it? First, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, why am I here? Uh, I work with Acorn International in a dozen, 15 countries. I've been a community organizer and labor organizer for the last close to 45 odd years. Um, and I've been in touch with a number of people here with the Edinburgh Private Tennis Association, and we've talked a lot about some interest in people understanding more about how ACORN works. It doesn't work necessarily in the same way all organizations work, although they're common elements between all community-based organizations. And basically, I wanted to come over here and sort of support the work, try to see if there was any way I could be helpful, spread some information, answer some questions, figure out if this is something that belongs here, or really it's something we ought to quarantine and keep you know, elsewhere in the world. When we talk about community organizing, we talk about a particular brand of things, though. Um, there's a lot of things that people put in the basket of community-based organizing or community organization now that are different than what we would understand when we're talking about it. One, we're talking about things that are about building power. Change. So it's not just a social welfare organization, or a counseling group, or a, a housing organization. It's a community-based organization where people are able to come together collectively to organize for change, to try to resolve long-standing, sometimes historic grievances that they feel very deeply as part of their self and mutual interest. Because people individually don't have as much capacity to create change as we would like to believe, or as people in some cases argue, we have to come together in organizations, some sort of formation, some sort of group, to create change. This is a messy, difficult struggle. It's a fight often, and therefore you need organizations that can be strong enough and sustainable and large enough to be able to build power. It's very difficult to understand power differently than politics. Uh, so although a lot of people don't particularly like the notions of power or politics, making change in the public forum and the public space is very difficult without some level of political strength. And you get that by banding together in a community organization. 
And that's what ACORN has always been. So when we organize, where we organize ACORN International over the last eight to 10 years since it was founded out of the experience in the United States, uh, initially we started organizing in Peru, Lima, Peru, and the mega slums there are called, Coro Gocha, uh, called uh, San Juan Largancho. And we got to Peru very simply because after the Fujimura dictatorship ended, they were trying to rebuild civil society. And a number of people from Peru, because of political oppression, had relocated to the United States. So as this opportunity to rebuild civil society in the election of Alejandro Toledo uh, occurred, there was interest in people who had been active in Lima and Peru in the past to see if they could duplicate what their experience in the United States was with ACORN. So we went there and we first started by in two different ways. One was a partnership with labor unions to try to prevent the privatization of water, sewer services throughout the country as part of neoliberalism, bringing in private companies largely. Uh, this, this industry at that time was dominated by French-based companies. And they would subcontract the whole administration of, of water and sewer to a multinational company away from the workers' union and uh, the local city control. We had fought similar fights in the United States, stopping the privatization of water in New Orleans, in, in uh, uh, Stockton, California, in Atlanta, Georgia, and therefore it was easy for us to, you know, to create a partnership with FinTAP, the union of, of sewer and water workers in Peru, to try to see if we could help them rebuild their membership as well as prevent privatization of their jobs. The second partnership we created was, was with uh, a group of Commodores uh, in, in Peru uh, during the dictatorship uh, because of the poverty in the communities. Women, largely women, uh, and the Commodores, uh, Populares, uh, the group that we partnered with, was running 1,500 different community kitchens in all kinds of low and moderate income areas. And they wanted to work with us to see if they could now, as the government came in, expand to not just deal with food issues, hunger, but to also spread to health and uh, housing and other issues. So in the beginning, we thought we would just operate internationally, not in the way we did in the United States, but find some kind of local organizations and formations that we could help support, partner with, make stronger. It actually turned out to be very difficult. And although our partnership with FemTAP, because it was a membership-based organization, spread and grew, uh, the partnership with Comanderos was very difficult because they were not sustainable, it turned out. They, most of their foodstuffs came from government donations, and in fact, it was impossible for them to move from food to other issues. They had a leadership uh, structure which, uh, in sort of the world of Occupy, uh, might seem, you know, ideal. They changed all their leaders every year. Well, that meant you could have a partnership one year and then you were starting over a year later. So there was really no way to have a membership decision or a leadership uh, vision of where they want the organization to go. Every year, you sort of turn the calendar back and went back to serving lunch uh, for two soles or whatever the, the main program was. So that was a more difficult thing to sustain. And eventually, the people we were working to, with in Peru said, why don't we build a membership organization for the poor just like you have in the United States? And that's why we ended up working in San Juan de la Rancho, the million and a half mega slum right on the outside of, of Lima. And I tell all the story about Peru just because the way we ended up doing international work was a relationship of dues paying members in the United States who had relative experiences in other countries. So from there we were in the Dominican Republic, we were in Canada, Mexico, along the border. For any of you, have any of you ever been to the United States? Yeah. Lots of you. Who's never been to the United States? Well, we'd love to leave. You know, for the rest of you, you may, you may realize that the fastest growing uh, 
minority population in the United States is Latino. And that's part of what the major issue about immigration reform is and, and the political debates right now in Washington within Congress. So that was also true, obviously, of a, a low to moderate income membership organization like ACORN. We had a half million members of which the minority was Caucasian, maybe 25%. Another 40, 45% was African American, and then the rest was all Latino. Many of those were undocumented workers, immigrant families who've been here frequently for years, but without the, the rights of citizens in the United States. So they went back and forth across, particularly the border to Mexico, quite routinely, and therefore the first place we worked in Mexico was Tijuana, and then Mexico City, largely in the Mesa, which is the world's largest mega slum, three and a half billion people. Actually, it's in the state of Mexico, not in that big. Um, but that's, so in each case, there's a story. A story of some ACORN leader, some ACORN member who kept tugging at uh, our sleeves until we said, how do you say no to people who want to organize? And that's also what puts me in Edinburgh. How do you say no to people who want to organize? So ACORN International's countries that we work in Canada and North America. We do some projects in the United States, so I'll get back to that at some length. Mexico, Dominican Republic, Honduras, San Pedro Sula, Tegucigalpa, Buenos Aires, and Argentina, Mingo, Peru, and most recently Quito and Ecuador. And in each case in Latin America, these are largely in mega slums or the colonias where there are still huge issues about access to potable water, adequate housing, or whatever. We also work in Korogochu, the second largest but oldest slum in Nairobi and Kenya. We work in three cities in India, uh, Bengaluru, which is commonly known as Bangalore uh, here in the west, uh, Mumbai, and Delhi. And we have partnerships in other places, and more recently, in the last couple of years, we've responded to interest in Italy, Prague, and here we are back in Edinburgh again, Edinburgh. So that's where we work, and there are other projects that may or may not develop. Um, in each case, uh, we respond based on the kinds of issues and interests there is in those areas. Rome is very interesting. We'll get into that because some, in some cases, uh, in Toronto, uh, both of those organizations were initially based uh, in Rome, so fully based on the issues of Temecin and a lot of what is going on here in Edinburgh has to do with tennis as well. So uh, the experience of, of ACORN in the United States, though, is part of what set the principles of this work together. So uh, in talking about that, uh, let me go through some of the experience. ACORN started originally in Little Rock, Arkansas, on June 18th of 1970. At that time, coming out of the 1960s, the experience was different than you might expect now. The experience was single-issue organizations. There was a national welfare rights organization that solely organized welfare recipients to try to protect existing benefits and expand benefits on the welfare system as it existed in the early 60s in the United States. There was a national tenants organization. There were civil rights organizations about the rights of African Americans and others within society. There was a a whole band of single issued organizations. ACORN, from the very beginning, wanted to build a multi, uh, a multi issued organization, not just dealing with the issues of tenants or welfare recipients or housing based or any one specific thing, but it was multi issued. It wanted a diverse constituency, uh, so it didn't want to have just white members or just Latino members or just African American members. We wanted to have the flexibility structurally to represent everybody in the low to moderate income community. It wanted to have a majority constituency. And by that we meant uh, it wanted to not represent a single band of the poor or just one piece of uh, issues and grievances that uh, lower income people had, but enough that it could argue that uh, were we successful organizing that we represented a majority of people. Not necessarily at the numbers, but uh, in a place.
place like Arkansas at the time I started Acorn in 1970, more than 70% of the people made less than 7,000 US dollars a year. So it wasn't a lot of money. Um, in fact, Arkansas, Louisiana, and a number of the states in the South are still relatively very poor compared to California, New York, uh, Pennsylvania, and some places like that. But what it meant is by selecting issues that appeal to the widest part of the uh, working class, low to moderate income community, it gave us more potential strength than just if we represented welfare recipients or just if we represented any one band of, of our constituency. And I've come, before I started ACORN, I'd worked as an organizer in, in Massachusetts for the National Welfare Rights Organization. And in Boston, at the time I was in the organization, one out of seven people was on welfare. Well, that's a lot of people. But it's not enough to protect yourself politically when we became more successful at expanding benefits. The state then decided to cut out those benefits and raise the whole, uh, what was a flat grant, raise the whole basic payment instead of allowing people specialized payments for clothes or food or, or housing or whatever we were exploiting. And the organization, uh, as strong as it was in Massachusetts, couldn't really resist that because it had no allies outside of its own base. In fact, welfare recipients, and I don't know how it is here in Scotland or elsewhere in the UK, there were, continued, there were serious prejudices against the fact that people would even have the concept of rights to welfare. And that's a welfare rights organization was about the fact that if you were eligible and based on your economic circumstances, you should have the full rights to every benefit that was allowable in that program. That was not and still isn't 40 some years later the way most Americans view the welfare system. They want it to be punitive, they want it to be pejorative, they want it to be, you know, a mark on your forehead, a letter on your chest. And that's not the way the organizations were built or how a lot of people see it. Expanding the base of the organization to a majoritarian constituency allowed us to look at a way to build power differently than just as a special pleading of an individual group. We could then take these organizations within the structure of ACORN, ally them together so that they could act to support each other in certain situations. So a neighborhood group also had the benefit of support by other neighborhoods, not just its own community. Um, that's not to say that there isn't huge value in other kinds of organizations like you know, private tenants organizations or whatever. It's just to say this was a historical uh, effort to build ACORN as a multi-constituency organization. It was also important that we be involved in direct action. Uh, as a principal of the organization, Association of Community Organizations for Reform now, and it was about change. It was very explicitly about change. It was about uh, uh, persistence that once the campaign, we may not win every campaign, we were definitely going to fight to the end. So, it was about direct action, it was about rallies, demonstrations, petitions, but it was also, and this is the other thing that distinguished it in the United States uh, for quite a long time, because it was a democratic organization, it was membership based, anything the members raised their hands and decided to do, we were going to do. So there weren't external limits. It wasn't that, uh, I don't know how tax laws work in, in, uh, in this country, but Many organizations, many community-based organizations in the United States are tax-exempt. The trade-off for being tax-exempt is that you cannot be involved in politics. So, you have this problem that the members decide, well, this issue, you know, is coming right from the mayor's office or right from the governor's office or wherever else, and your financial support is based on your tax status, then no matter how many times the members might argue it or raise their hand if they want to take some action, as an organizer, you're going to stand up in the back and say, you know, you really can't, you can't do that unless you want to lose your funding, unless you, you know, want to have problems with the Internal Revenue Service or, or whatever. Well, we didn't believe in that. So we believed if you're going to have a democratically based organization and the members make a decision, that's what the organization is then empowered to do. Not that there was going to be some artificial restraint based on a 
tax debt. So uh, for the first eight years, Acorn didn't even uh, incorporate it. Uh, as a formal organization registered with the state because uh, that made it more easy to block the organization in legal injunctions. Uh, it forced, if uh, opponents were going to try to stop the organization, by going to court and getting orders to stop it, you'd have to name every single member being enjoined. You couldn't just say, no acorn. You had to say, no acorn, Wade Matthew, no acorn, you know, here's snow, no acorn. And yeah, who's going to do that? So you couldn't really stop us in that way. Um, once the organization started expanding more rapidly out of acorn, we had to incorporate it. But uh, throughout the whole history of the organization, it was a nonprofit. It just wasn't tax exempt. Nonprofit meant that uh, it didn't distribute money to its shareholders, the membership and officers were not paid. Uh, but, and believe me, uh, no matter how big it got, it never made money. I can, I can assure you of that. So it was nonprofit as a principle in every way. But it was never tax exempt. If we had all of a sudden uh, hit the lottery and ended up with an extra 10, 10 million, well, we would have had to pay taxes. And that would have been a fair deal, as opposed to deciding the campaign strategy, tactics, and course of action for everything the organization did. I don't want to beat this to death, but it's actually pretty important if you want to make change, whether or not you get to decide the change or somebody else does. And, and deciding how to build an organization here in Edinburgh or anywhere else in your life around the world, you might want to think about that. So membership then, was another huge principle. We really believed that everything started from the membership. And there was a very clear division between organizers like me and the elected leaders who came out of that membership. We couldn't be a member. It wasn't like a labor union where an organizer could pay dues and, you know, at least in the United States, I don't know how unions work here, but five or ten years later, you said, well, you know, I'll run for office. And because you were paying dues, you could be an office pair. Well, that wasn't the case in, in eight points. So listen, on the staff, you're not a leader of the organization. The leaders of the organization are actually people who pay dues, run for election on a regular basis, whatever the terms of the bylaws and constitution say, once a year, every other year, whatever it is, and therefore they're empowered to make the decisions in a different way. So we always had a division of those two things, and the membership, in order to own the organization, had to believe that when they made the decision, it actually mattered. And part of the way they did that is by paying dues. So a principle of ACORN is always that the members, no matter how low income, and that's still true of ACORN International, paid membership dues, equivalent to all of the member, to support the organization. That way it was there, that's where they owned it. And I know uh, that's not necessarily a comfortable decision in all cultures, um, but it's actually something that was very unique in, 1970, when we started collecting dues, probably uh, immediately, but it wasn't as much serious until 71 or so. And ACORN was unique in that way for many, many years, and still is uh, uh, in the United States, because many groups don't have a membership dues system that tries to, to support the direct activity of the organization. It's a little bit more like a union community, if you will. Unions are supported by dues. God knows if you expect the unions to get charity money and government money in order to fight for higher wages and better benefits for employers, all of us would see that as absurd. Well, the government's not going to fund unions to fight companies that collect taxes. I mean, immediately we would understand that proposition just doesn't work. It's not logical. We thought of that, but don't be wrong. You know, we, we don't know what to do with that. But somehow, when we look at community-based organizations, organizations are about change, we somehow think that there's a different equation involved, that somehow the government or charities or the rich, uh, you know, in the U.S. through philanthropies, will fund community-based membership organizations to actually fight for change from the government, which might not be in their interest. Is that logical? I mean, just to stop here for a second, and we'll get into more detail, but does that make sense to people? That I don't know how charities work here. I think there are a lot of them. If we walk through what neighborhoods that built in yesterday, boy, every other door that was rented seemed to be some nonprofit, some sort of charitable, clothes selling, charitable, counseling, charitable, this, that, and the other, etc. 
that surely on the outside has sort of been shareable. Um, but many, I don't know who supports all these things, and many of them may be sustainable, but if they are supported by the government or charities as basic organizations, are there limits to what they can do or are there not? Some of them are cut up. So what? Some of the organizations uh, are cut up. And other ones, uh, I'm talking about their managers, it depends who's running them. Uh, my mother worked for the Cancer Research, and uh, we would go to trips in London uh, on the plane, first class, and I'd have cheese nights and champagne nights. My mother just refused to go. You know? There was a bit of corruption in Edinburgh, and uh, there was no bit of but Edinburgh, certainly, <coughs> uh, in some of these organisations. Gotcha. Yeah, but the likes of them as well, a big chat, isn't it?
Yeah, you get a plus Workfare, as uh, I can say, you know, I started out as a welfare rights organizer years ago. And workfare is something that, uh, you know, we fought for many, many years in the United States on a losing basis. Uh, and it's certainly picked up steam everywhere. Uh, there's now a proposal that you can get into public housing or what you would call uh, social housing. There may start to be a work test that you actually have to have a job in order to be in public housing. Part of the reason you need to be in public housing is you don't have a job. So, I mean, it's just, but I'm over here when they just talked about that, so I guess. But I think all these are problems. I'm not saying that there's no way these organizations can be effective. I'm not trying to, you know, broad brush say that it's impossible for them to ever be a factor in change. But there is a logic that, I mean, none of this scheme behind Create Acorn was based on any particular brilliance. In some cases, it's just a, a matter of following the logical conclusions that if you want an organization that can make change for a long period of time, you may have to have a way in which that organization can be sustainable. Dues is part of that. If you want an organization that has freedom to act in any way possible, you may not stop at a certain line that says you don't go and you know endorse somebody different from mayor because the mayor won't put your program together. So what are you supposed to do when you say, do you have mayors here? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know who has power in the council, but let's say you're going to the council, and you know, X, Y, and Z council people, and you're, you want this kind of development, you don't want this particular housing block to be torn down, you've got issues, you've really got a beat, you've got hundreds of people behind you, and you're fired up and ready to go, and there you are, and they say, screw you, no. So what do you do next? Go home? Be unhappy? Leave the organization so that you can vote as an individual citizen in some other direction? Or as an organization, since you started an organization in order to come together and make change, do you figure out then what you're going to do with that target? Well, that was the same problem that Acorn had many, many years ago before most of you were born. We just didn't see the line stop. That if that mayor, that council person, that school board member, that legislator, that whoever said, no, we needed to be able to keep fighting. And sometimes that meant we would endorse you to go against him. And often won, because it was a mass-based organization. And having a mass base is part of what a membership builds. It builds the residents to be able to take those people who are paying dues and to combine with them as neighbors, friends, relatives, whatever, to build a mass base that's effective enough to make change. So right from the very beginning, when we stopped putting a limit on what people can do in 1972, in Little Rock, Arkansas, a place unknown to most of you, uh, <coughs> it was a city not that much different in size from Edinburgh. We elected the first school board member who'd ever been elected without coming from the fifth ward, a particular ward, by putting all the lower income wards together to be it. Well, that actually helped us build power, not in the way that we would argue that numbers equal power. If we have, if we have more numbers, therefore we have more power. But people understand power is political as well. So if you can't act to, in the United in the, in terms of uh, the old labor leaders in the United States to punish your enemies and to reward your friends, you have a problem exchanging the currency of, of power. So we got, so ACORN from uh, 1972 throughout its history was involved appropriately in politics, not in politics that we couldn't, I mean, it would have been ridiculous as a organization we were only in Arkansas to somehow say we have an opinion on who should be president of the United States, and we weren't, we weren't foolish about it, but if a campaign led that way, we followed the campaign as far as it took to win, and sometimes that meant putting issues on the ballot, you know, raising wages, or stopping uh, charging taxes on food and medicine, or going to the legislature to fight for those things. If it was our membership's issue, and they were involved in the campaign, uh, there were no limits. And I would, uh, once again, I'm not encouraging you to make a decision about this, but this is how ACORN looked at those kinds of things. Um, on dues, the, when I left uh, ACORN in the United States, 
States five years ago, the news were $10 a month. Uh, I don't know what the equivalent would be here. In Canada now, where we have the largest of the organizations, they were international, it's $15, 15 Canadian dollars a month. So that's not a huge amount of money. Uh, and it's not, so most everybody can pay it. And the dues in a international is basically translated from that currency into whatever the local currency is. So the dues is 10 pesos a month uh, in Mexico. It's three soles a month in Peru. Now here's what may surprise you or may not, because I don't know enough about you and your experience, but no matter how poor the community we work in, whether it's in has anybody ever seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire? Okay, big popular movie. So we work in Slum Dorabi. We organize associations of rag pickers. Uh, we organize rickshaw pullers. We organize domestic workers. People who don't make hardly uh, 100, 150 rupees a day. But the dues are 50 rupees a month. And people pay those dues. Now the big issue of dues is asking, not collecting. If you don't have a problem asking, members actually don't understand an organization that doesn't ask them to do this. I had this experience, and I'll share it with you, in the Philippines uh, uh, about eight years ago. Uh, a bunch of community, there's actually a very <laughs> vibrant history of community organizations in the Philippines. They were very important in uh, winning democracy after the Marcos regime. That and the other. And we were in this particular slum which was built in a shipyard where the Chanel Marcus in fact had owned and the shipyard had largely been dismantled and become, you know, squats and housing for people over the last 20 or 30 years. And the, the organizers who invited me into Manila to visit with them were very intrigued about this whole notion of membership organization and dues, but of course it wouldn't work in the Philippines because people are too poor, they'll never pay dues. So they took me around this tour of this uh, shipyard neighborhood and uh, fascinated leaders and they were translating between the local language and the English I can speak or understand. And all of a sudden we're in their little office, uh, you know, a little 10 foot square area and they start describing something that really sounded like a local fundraiser in the way they were translating. So I asked them a couple questions and I said, well, do you collect dues? And, and to the shock of my host, they translated, well, you know, the organizers don't believe we collect dues, but you can't really run the organization without dues. So, yeah, we collect dues, we just don't tell them. <laughs> and it's one, of, it's one of my favorite stories forever in my work. But, I mean, the truth is, people, poor people, very poor people, don't understand if it just comes from heaven, if it's their organization, they don't know how you would support that organization if you don't do a fundraiser or chip in your rupees or pesos or do what it takes to actually support it. They don't assume somehow that someone else is going to fund them to make change. So the truth is, if the biggest problem we ever had putting together a due system in the United States originally and anywhere else in, in a corner national was getting through the organizers, not getting through the members. Because the organizers, many of them come from all kinds of walks of life, and some of them are working people, some of them are middle class, some of them are who knows where. I don't know, don't interview for that. But because they saw the organization's membership as poorer than they were, they were uncomfortable saying that somehow there should be, that poor people should pay money to actually support the organization. And they were always shocked. I remember an early staff meeting in, in the, you know, 1971 or so, and the organizer uh, felt terrible. She kept bringing up the issue that she had not been able to do as much work in the Dixie neighborhood over across the river. And, you know, the more we started, well, why do you feel bad about that? You're working over here and here, you're at the meeting, whatever. Well, she felt bad about it because people in that neighborhood were paying dues faster and more consistently than the other neighborhoods, and yet she didn't feel like she was putting in as much time in that neighborhood. So it just never occurred to her that people were paying dues based on 
their assessment of the value of the organization, not based on her assessment of the value. It was actually their organization in Dixie. It wasn't really her organization in Dixie at all. So although she had this enormous sort of internal accounting system of labor to dues payment, what we always found, and, you know, luckily in, in the way you stumble along with these things, and later on you find there are a whole bunch of academics and studies and surveys that prove it, is that the lower income groups we had in Acorn from the very beginning paid dues more consistently and regularly than the more middle income, more working. And, and you know, it, it, there's sort of a disconnect. Of course, we didn't get that. But now it turns out, at least in the United States, and I, I don't know about here, that in the level of the 1% as opposed to the 99% of the rest of us, the lower income you are, the more charitable you are as a percentage of your income. Now, your charity may not be to the official tax exempt thing. The way we do taxes in the United States, you have to be rich to get any benefit from taxes. So there's, re there's really no reason to be tax exempt because you think somehow your members are going to be able to deduct their little dues. I mean, that's not how it works. If you're rich, you itemize your taxes so you can take advantage of every little dollar you gave to somebody. If you're just a regular taxpayer, there's no advantage to all the charity you give. It gives you no tax breaks. I don't know how, like I said, this is probably relevant to you. I don't know why I'm going to it. So don't move to the United States because you're going to lose a tax break. Right? <laughs> Take that one with you. But the point is, whether it's people buying groceries or giving people rides or what they give in church or, you know, somebody loaning money to a friend they, or a guy or a woman they work with or a neighbor, Everybody knows they'll never get that money back. That is, in fact, charity. And that's what lower income people do, just like this, this group of leaders told me in, in Manila. But it's also true everywhere in the world. And it actually, I don't want to act like you know, I'm a fanatic about this, but people actually feel better paying their own dues. Even if it's only a couple of rupees here, a couple of uh, pesos there. And I think if you're thinking about building an organization, these are the kind of questions you really need to think about as well, because it's not necessarily how you think about it. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I don't know if anybody you know, knows anything about heavyweight boxing, but there was a famous boxer called Sonny Liston, who was the world champion, which meant he was the champion of the United States probably at that time. Cassius Clay, who later became known as Muhammad Ali, was this young, young fellow coming out of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And he was going to fight the big bear, as he called him, the big ugly bear, Sonny Liston. And in Sports Illustrated a magazine in the uh, States, they were going through you know, how crazy it was that Cassius Clay and Muhammad Ali had not only fought Sonny Liston and won, but his lawyer had demanded he get a guarantee of princely sum of money at that time, $400,000, to guarantee win, lose, or draw against Sonny Liston, he was going to get that money. And so they were interviewing his lawyer at Sports Illustrated, and they said, well, how crazy were you? What were you thinking to ask for $400,000 for Cassius Clay, who had never beaten anybody, was unknown, just a U.S. Olympics medal? The lawyer said, you know, the issue is not the $400,000, it's whether or not you stutter when you ask. You know, that took that as a life lesson that Sonny Liston and Cassius Clay taught me. The issue is not the money, it's really whether or not you stutter when you ask. So if you're talking to people about dues, whether it's, you know, 10 pounds or 10 dollars or 10 pesos, the question is not the dues, it's whether or not you stutter when you ask. Because if you stutter, you should get challenged. If it's really not important for you to collect that dues, then I should ask, why do I have to pay dues? But if, in fact, you believe, as many of our members and leaders all believe, that you couldn't have the organization, you didn't have a chance to fight for change if you didn't pay your dues, then it was actually easy. There was a stuttering involved. Does this sound crazy when I'm talking about the dues? I just want to stop for a second just to you know, do a sanity check here. Uh, and I'm up here, you know, telling these stories. Make any sense what I'm saying? Is there any experience? I mean, labor unions have dues, obviously. Is there any experience? Give us a say in the money's made to go right. 
So I was just going to, uh, I agree with what you're saying, but I suppose I was just going to argue that I have experienced that people are very resistant to paying dues um, because I think there is a, a historical expectation in Britain anyway of, of the state having more responsibility and, um, and that charities are an addition, you know, and, uh, and, and, and the things that they provide are an addition. But if you, if you really want to improve, you know, welfare and citizens' rights and and anything that really matters to people's sort of everyday living, then you, 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 that goes through your council tax and your income tax, 
and that you should sort of you know act for change within this within the system, I suppose, rather than outside. So I suppose that's why there's this suspicion that any organisations on the outside are just doing something additional rather than. Well, and I don't want to discount that. In our experience, there's always some testing. If people don't ask you what the dues is for or why there's dues or whatever, and those are legitimate questions. And if you're not able, as a member, a leader, or an organizer, to answer those questions, you shouldn't be collecting their dues. I mean, I think that's not just uh, Britain. It's everywhere in the world that people test you. They want to decide whether the money is really that important to the organization or more important to them. And believe me, lower income people want you to make your case. If you're not able to make your case, they should keep their money. I think that's a fair, fair trade. But that testing is what you should expect from all people in the dialectic of normal conversation. It's not necessarily a resistance from people to paying dues. They want to value you on the dues they pay. It's true in unions. So the contest in unions, if you've ever been to one, about raising the level of dues, no matter what the opposition may put, those are robust debates. Vister, you know, drawn. You know, there's a lot of the struggle every time. But people want to know if they're going to pay more dues or how much dues, what it's for. That's what a leadership is going to stand has to be accountable on. I think that's, that testing and accountability is very fair in the dues exchange. Bank drafts is what we call when, you know, the last 10 or 15 years when it was possible to not have people, you know, hand collect in every local meeting and door to door the dues every month. Being able to collect a good amount of the dues through bank drafts in their accounts was a remarkable financial advantage for ACORN allowing us to expand. So I hear that it's a lot of charities do that, and that's that's a good system. Because it regularizes your dues. Now you do those flat rates or do you, you know, look sort of means testing? Don't do any means testing. We don't discriminate. Same level of our membership, everybody pays the same dues because their voice is equal. We don't want anybody to ever believe their voice is not equal to anybody else's. So, we don't do a sliding scale, we don't do something different for you if you're retired, different for if you're on the A, or different for if you're, you know, it's all one size fits all because the vote is equal. And we expect you to work hard. Well, Yeah, it's not uncommon in the United States at all. It's certainly not something I believe in or have uh, believe is necessarily what builds the kind of organization that I think you want to build. No, it's very common. You said that your hand up before, and I didn't forget about it. Um, I'm thinking of
I don't want to mislead anybody about you know, the purity of this. So in ACORN, which is the membership organization in the United States between 1970 and when I left uh, five years ago, which would have been 2008, we have 500,000 members. But we also, and then that membership is made of local community organizations at each city level, state level, and a delegate structure. But we also had other organizations within a larger family, like uh, we had one organization that helped develop housing and counseled uh, our members on uh, their credit and whether or not they could afford to buy a house. So this, this particular organization, uh, we got money from banks to help finance some of it because they were getting bank loans. We got some money from uh, HUD, which is the Housing and Urban Development, it's a federal agency because we were at housing counselors. So it's not ACORN membership organization that was making these decisions, had subsidiary or partnership relationships with a whole series of organizations. In fact, uh, in 2009, after I left, when Congress started attacking ACORN, their whole big issue was they argued that there were 168 different corporations in the, fam the ACORN family of organizations. But by that point, we were, from the time I left, we were a very large organization. We were 1,500 people on staff. We were spending between 80 and 100 billion dollars a year. There were lots of different corporations. I mean, anytime we bought a building, we put it in a separate building corporation. We didn't keep it in ACORN. But ACORN was sort of the heart of the organization, and then arms and legs go in every kind of direction. Well, and those arms and legs might get funding from a whole bunch of sources, but they didn't impact the decision of whether or not ACORN endorsed somebody for president, or whether or not ACORN was involved in a political issue, whether or not ACORN decided on a particular issue. So I'm not trying to say you have to imagine building an organization where dues pays 100% of the bills. It may for a long time, but as you get larger, and certainly as we got larger, maybe too large uh, to be able to, to be sustainable. Uh, and that's a, a different story. There became lots of other organizations, so we just wouldn't put those in ACORN. If somebody wanted to do a housing project, we would create another organization that was a partner of ACORNs to do that, so that whatever happened in that stream of funding or whatever was not problematic to the main core of the organization. Well, this was interesting about dues, but yes, ma'am. I was just going to ask you, before you branched off into the subsidiary uh, groups, did you pay from the direct membership, did you pay any of your administrative people? Um, you know, for example, sure. you, did, you did? Sure. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there are, you know, the United States is a very, you know, there's laws and regulations about everything, probably just like there is here. So we had three labor unions, for example, that we, we started uh, when particular groups of law firm workers were not being organized by other unions. Well, over the years, some of these became part of larger labor unions or still part of the ACORN family, but there's a whole set of different laws and regulations that affect labor unions than those that affect nonprofits. Most of them are nonprofit. But you know, you have different things you have to file. You know, there's lots of different rules. So that's more of the issue, is how you, you know, make it all work together. But uh, the point that we're making here about structure is, I can't say too strongly that the beginning prejudice the ends. How you begin an organization will often determine what that organization can be many years down the road. So you want the most organic and natural structure you can have. Um, there's a, an organization that I'm working with right now in the United States, uh, started by some people in Baltimore, and before they even started working, they have produced a, you know, 20 pages of bylaws and constitution about a very elaborate, intricate, you know, delegates and, you know, I can't even imagine how they will ever organize anything with the set of rules they have before they start. What we did is make sure, start from 
membership, and that membership was represented at every level by elections, but tried to keep the actual governing body fluid enough that the organization could adapt over time. So there were community organizations at different times. There were worker-based organizations that also were represented at different times. There were organizations of veterans, or unemployed workers. Now, each of those pieces worked in a principle we called Okay, so structure, organic, flexible, adaptable. Not rigid, okay? Robert's Rules of Order. Anybody use that? Death. Yeah. This is death to a, to a membership organization because it empowers the, you know, the jailhouse lawyers and your members, not the members. So those people who know the three ways to get called for order and questions or whatever, all of a sudden they have a role way opposed to anything that they were elected. What, what, did you just talk about a bit or something that? Did you just base it on the uh, Robert's Rules of Order? Mm -hmm. It's a little, you seem to know, it's a little rule book. I don't know if it came from the United States or here. It's using IWW, that's the name I The principle we use structurally was coordinated autonomy. Each local group was autonomous in that it could self-correct. It could make its own decisions based on if it was a community organization, the members in that community. So if it was an issue in Pilton, where we were yesterday, then members in Pilton would decide what the issues were in Pilton. Members in, give me another neighborhood here. Take one. Could decide what's happening in that neighborhood. But now, if the Pilton people had an issue that they wanted to work on that jumped out of Pilton and affected your area as well, then there had to be coordination at the leadership level. There had to be an agreement before they could go forward. Same thing. So we could have labor unions, we could have community organizations, we could have all these different groups. If there was a citywide issue, all those organizations that were part of ACORN in that city had to come to a conclusion. If it ever had to do with a political enforcement, for example, it wasn't just consensus, but it was based on a supermajority. To endorse somebody, you had to have 75% of the support of everyone in that political jurisdiction. That doesn't mean that nobody was ever unhappy, but you reduce the chance of there being unhappiness that the majority had to be so great. When they court on the national level endorsed Obama in the 2008 election, that was a result of three different leadership balloting procedures over a, a, almost a year period where he failed to get 75 percent. Hillary Clinton, you know, had support from our New York organization. And uh, a guy who's now discredited out of North Carolina had the most, uh, you know, populist positions. And he had huge support uh, uh, from our leadership. And, you know, and Obama had support from our Illinois and some of our African American leadership. But there was a, uh, the guy who's the governor of New Mexico had support from leadership coming from those states that where we had uh, primary leadership of Latino. So to shake it all out, it took lots of polling until you got 75%. It didn't matter how historic President Obama or Barack <laughs> Obama was, his race for the presidency was, we weren't there. Um, but coordinated autonomy is a very effective principle because it forces people to have to come to some consensus to act together when they need each other. And it also forces each, or, each part of the organization to be realistic about the, the prospects of winning. If one little neighborhood thinks it can somehow, as the tail, drag the whole uh, city you know, into a certain position, that's very difficult. Or one city within a state. I mean, if it was. Uh, we had 13 different uh, offices in a place like California. So the notion that you would go to the legislature in Sacramento based on what the organization in Oakland believed as opposed to all the organizations coming to some conclusion statewide was very difficult. Nationally, there had to be a consensus of all of the 38 states where, where Acorn had membership in the country. So, I mean, that's how it works, but that's also this kind of principle allowed us to have a more flexible structure. Everybody was equally represented. Uh, 
you know, we used to say we work largely by consensus. Consensus obviously has a very heightened meaning now. Uh, in the days of Occupy, whatever, we had no hand signals, we had no, you know, meetings that went until 3 in the morning. People had to wake up and go to work the next day. But coordinated autonomy was very critical uh, in our growth. With me? We all hang in? Mm -hmm. Okay, first thing to do is politics, dialectical process. Uh, a good way of understanding the organizing process is, and I, it's actually a great quote, it's a process by which a, a personal problem becomes a political issue. Sociologist uh, from years ago in the United States named C. Wright Mills, who wrote a book called Power Elite, and a number of others. And this is how he defined dialectical politics. Regardless of what the context is, it's a very good way of understanding how a membership based organization makes decisions. You listen, which turns out to be way more important than talking, to members every day on the doors, in meetings, at the street corner, whatever. And eventually, as you hear things, that people start from a place that their issue, that their problem is a personal problem. Maybe it's their fault, or maybe it's something they did. And it's only as they meet and join with others that they start to realize that their very personal problem about welfare, about housing, about wages, about whatever, may be shared by lots of people. And then the organizational process, as you put all those people together in the same organization and take action, that very personal problem and its evolution becomes a political issue. You've seen that happen, I bet. It's worth keeping in mind. Okay, so we built, uh, we built groups by something we call the, the ACORN model. And you're getting a fair idea of how a lot of it worked. Certainly involved all these principles that I've discussed, coordinator and autonomy. But let me just go through some of the central pieces. One, we always build every organization, whether it's in the labor, workplace context, or in the community context, on an organizing committee. Now, an organizing committee would be people from that area, from that workplace, who would take the responsibility to carry the weight of the organizing drive. Seems so simple, doesn't it? Everybody would be organized. This is all, none of this is like rocket science. I mean, it's all very straightforward. So if you organize in a neighborhood, let's say that 3,000, 2,000 households in a particular neighborhood in Hilton or the one you said, what would you imagine would be a good organizing committee? What size would it be? 2,000 families, 10 people, would that be enough? A lot of work getting a hold of 2,000 different households. Take a guess. I mean, I'm not, none of you are paid organizers. We're just having a conversation here.
trying to build an organization throughout this neighborhood. Where would you, geographically, where would you want to organize a committee, at least 20 people to come from? Everywhere, right. I mean, what good would it do you if all of them were here? I mean, yeah, you might have 20 people, but would they be the 20 people that could organize it all here? This is what happens in, in many uh, labor union organizing drives that are started by, this is why hot shops, if you know what I'm talking about, don't work. Because hot shops means that in the United States that you got to call, a union got to call from a particular, maybe there were 200 workers, and everybody in the paint department called and said, we need a union here, it's terrible here, we've got to organize. Well, if you're only in the paint department, where there are 15 workers and there are 200 workers in the plant, that organized drive is never going to work unless you can get out of that paint department and get somebody from everywhere, whether it's a nursing home or whatever. Well, the same thing is true in the neighborhood. So if you want 20 people, and you may have a couple of names, you really want people sort of everywhere, which is what somebody said over here in this video. How do, you, how do you find these people? You don't have the organization yet. You've got little old you trying to organize this community. You and a friend, as you just said, or partner or colleague or whatever. So how do you find these 20 people that might give you the sense? Yeah? You have to get the information out there, don't you, first of all. So my instinct would be to, to write stories and start communicating about what you need and what you want. Jobs would be to go on doors, I guess. So, <laughs> We're just having a conversation, so there's no wrong track yet. We're going to get to what we do, but yeah. Uh, so, I think the way to say fishing. So, we find information that also to go to catch on to that, not like a speed room sort of waves. I like seeing analogies. So, like, you know, your first year people will be able to put the information out there the first time, you get only the people who are like four or five, and then once you go that, you can start having a discussion about more. Pointed sort of information gathering stories, as you said, and then try to go out and put that information in a more sort of you know, organized fashion and then get a bigger way to get other people and then start building it that way. And then we hold on like you know, public meetings and uh, just for like actual companies. Okay, now you're way ahead of us. We're just still trying to get organized. And then you want to, you know. So if you're fishing in this pool, this uh, lake or river, you're going to find the deep pools where you might find the fish you're trying to go to. Mm -hmm. If you're down here with your original, you know, colleagues, you're not going to find any fish up here unless you go up there somehow and figure out where to meet people. Which is, I guess, a little bit like fishing and finding where the ripples are and where the deeper pools are and what your fish is. Well, there are lots of ways to meet people. You can meet people on the corner, you can meet by going to local organizations, you could meet people by, you know, I guess door knocking, as you just said, John might, you know, go hit a door or two, well, you might have a reason to. Or you can, you can put the names together by people who know people. Maybe, uh, maybe I know somebody who's involved in an organization over here and I go visit with them, call it door knocking, and they give me five names over here two over there. Maybe also I've got this problem that this is a very diverse neighborhood. There may be, you know, people, uh, I think in the neighborhood we were walking in yesterday, there was a large Polish community, there were an African community. Well, if I want those represented, I've got to just get somebody or bodies part of the organizing committee. So maybe there's some kind of area, or eating place, or association, or church, or labor union, or you go to what are the gatekeepers for that community. And in those gatekeepers, you do two things with those gatekeepers. One, you communicate what you're trying to do, because you're transparent about it. You either get their support or you neutralize their opposition, both of which could be important. You don't want to fight with you while you're trying to organize. But at the same time, you might get lucky, and maybe they'll think what you're doing is a good idea, or at least they'll be positive. They'll say, hey, this is a crazy young kid. Hey, why not give the kid a chance? Yeah, you don't know. You don't know. Once again, don't stutter. Go ahead. So you talk to 
Joe or Jane or whoever that might be. And what the second thing you want is names. Pretty much a rule of all organizing. If you see, if you hear a name three times, you go find that person. That is somebody who, by definition, is a community leader because they already have a base. They may not be good for your organization, but they might be great for your organizing committee. And if they're not involved in an existing organization, they may be, may be wide open to be involved. Um, there are famous stories about this in organizing. Uh, there's a in the United States, there's a, a community organizer who became a labor leader named Cesar Chavez, who organized the United Farm Workers Union, if anybody ever heard of this. And now there's even a, a Latino community, there's Cesar Chavez's birthday celebrated, whatever. They started just like y'all are starting as a community organizer. But before I was a community organizer, there was somebody like me, somebody like you, named Fred Ross, who was organizing in, in Fresno. And he kept hearing this name. Hey, if you're really going to build, his, his organization is called the Community Service Organization, CSO. If you're really going to build this organization, have you got Cesar Chavez involved? So he kept hearing Chavez's name, figured he'd better find him. Three different times he door knocked on Chavez's house. Every time, the first two times he got there, they said he wasn't home. Not interested. Well, where is Chavez? Did. They didn't know. What was this Anglo guy looking for? No, got no word. Finally, the third time, he ran to the back door, caught Chavez going out the back door, forced him to have a conversation with him about the organization they were building. You know, he had 30 or 40 years, and you know, Cesar Chavez, the leader of the farm workers, great community organizer, great labor leader. And I'm not going to say that's going to happen to all of you, but the point is, you're looking for people you hear about. And some people you won't hear about, some people have never been involved in organizations, you'll find and they'll be attracted to the work and be willing to do the work. But in building this organizing committee of 20 people, the organizing committee is key because you can't do the work by yourself. I'm not saying you couldn't, but you should. You have to take the principle of community organizing that you were lazy, not that you're hard working. That it's better for other people to do the work than you. And that's not to say you don't do you know, your share of 12 and 13 hour days. It's not to say you don't worry about it. It's not to say you're not you know, on the pieces and making the list, but you want to always ask people to do the work. And it doesn't say that you might not think you could do the work better, or that you could do it more professionally, or you could do it faster, or whatever, and when it comes to typing and stuff like that, I mean, those are real challenges. But the point becomes, if you're going to have an organizing committee, you really need people who can team up to go, in our model, we would contact, we would hit the doors on all 2,000 of those units. So one person in a four week period can't hit 2,000 doors. It's just literally humanly impossible. And certainly you can't do it well. But now if you have teams of 10, or you have 20 people out there also building additional teams, or you have weekly organizing committees, which is part of our model, then you have a, you have a good shot at it. Now, you don't have forever to build an organization. I guess if you were doing it all by yourself in that 2,000 houses, you could take 20 weeks to do it. You could take five months. Would that be a good way to do it, or how do you get, I mean, part of what uh, the ACORN model is based on an organizing drive over four to six weeks, the time you have the organizing committee. The organizing committee that's meeting weekly because they have to discuss, you know, they have to measure the progress, how many doors are done, they have to look at how many yeses, how many maybes, they have to also report on what issues they're hearing. Because we believe that uh, going into the first meeting when you talk about issues, you're hearing all those issues by listening in these exchanges you're having in the doors. That's the organizing committee meeting. But part of what builds the organization is a sense of immediacy. You don't get that if you take six months or a year to organize it. You want people to understand that not like other organizations, not like other agencies, not like other nonprofits, their issue that they feel now is so important that it has to be dealt with now, not in the, in the by and by. And the only way you get that is having a 
fixed timeline to really build a, a strong organization that can demonstrate that, in fact, people will come together, they will discuss the issues, they will actually make decisions, and opposed to many organizations, they will take action. And almost every part of that is different than a lot of people's organizational experience. Because what you will have been hearing in those doors, whether those doors are in Mumbai or Kenya or the United States or here in Scotland, you'll hear all their bad experiences with the organization. All the reason you will fail. Debbie Downer will be on parade. It'll be, you know, loser bill. I mean, everybody has an organization that ripped them off, promised them wrong, did them dirty, was corrupt, whatever. So you will have just a litany of despair <laughs> that you'll be listening to. So you, you know, please don't get depressed, take yourself off, do whatever you have to do. The point is, you know where you're going because the organizing committee is processing all this information on a weekly basis and keeps pushing forward, listening and turning people back to the issues and challenging people to commit and engage with the organization because it will be different this time. And you have to prove it's different in the way you work. So what do you do when you're out there? You know, somebody was making the point about John's out door knocking. When he's out there door knocking, what's he doing? Just out for a stroll, having a chat? What's up with that door knocking? What would you imagine would be the key elements that you want to make sure John and anybody else was communicating on the doors? The people you speak to need to have a thing in them that they feel they can do, whether it's coming to a meeting or a statement and all that, and they keep it on. Yeah, I've got a sense of their reaction. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've got to say that their issues are being listened to, that you're not trying to project agenda on them. You've got to know you're not hustling. You've got to know, yeah, what you're listening. And when we were doing it, we were focused on the campaign for the most recent time, but we were also like asking people what their other issues were, and we were making notes and like taking kind of details. We had a petition, and then we kind of saw our next and they were really good, and we also trying to get more contact details for all of them. But we also had like different levels, like we did basic level design petitions, pretty much everybody did. We also had families. Did that on the doors or at the meeting or what? Well, we had, we had, we had two meetings because. Like it's easier to go to one because it's better to get more people that way. And we had meetings as well. We had a little demonstration at the end as well. But we were also trying to get people to hang around and really like also to have the organization and like a set of different activities that we kind of scaled up so we get people more involved and we wanted people to take positions around then and to get people which work quite well as well. So we had kind of different levels of that, but we also were building this for our own internal organization. So we wanted to make contact with people find out what their issues were. You have to decide what you want, because you're listening to a million things, right? And, you know, y'all are going to teach me, you know, Scottish slang, I'm going to teach you a lot of American slang, too, down on that, but you always have to be careful in uh, organizing terms that you don't swallow the ask. What could that possibly mean? Swallowing the ask. It's a little bit like this is not stuttering when you ask it, but swallowing the ask means if you want people to physically be at the first meeting, you can't give them a way to commit to something else other than being at the first meeting. Right? So if you give them, they're going to a grocery store and they get to shop for apples, oranges, and bananas, and you know, tomatoes, they're going to decide which one of those four things you're putting in front of them they want to buy. If you want them to only buy one thing, you have to narrow the choice, you have to not swallow the ants. Follow me at all? So if you really, in the acorn organizing model, we would always see what was the, we would always ask as part of the conversations with organizing committee members, community leaders, and others, what they defined as a large organization in their community. What was a big meeting? Was it 50 people? Was it 40 people? Was it 100? Because those things gave you a sense of what the benchmarks were in terms of people's expectations of organization. So if in this community of 2000 we were doing, 
if people said, hey, you know, so-and-so organization organized, uh, you know, five years ago, they had 50 people to a meeting, they really got together, and they were, you know, that. Well, then you say, look, there's going to be more than 50 people at this meeting. I could almost bet you if I were a better, I'm not an organizer, I'm, an organizer, I'm not a gambler, but if I was betting, I could bet there's going to be more than 50 people. So you're trying to actually, in that, those kind of terms, you're actually trying to prove that you're going to have something that people will immediately see as different from what their experience of organizing is in that particular context. But it's 20 or 200 or whatever it is, this is a piece of information as an organizer you might want to know. And although I understand what you're saying, and it's all right and wrong, and whatever, I mean, the point is, if one of the things you're trying to do is create this sense of a happening, that the building of that organization is the most important thing people have ever seen in that neighborhood, then you need to do everything that builds that momentum. Posters everywhere, everybody's talking about it, people are showing up in churches, you know, all saying, are you going to the meeting? You're doing, you know, multiple contacts with people, and you're doing everything possible to put bottles in the chairs. So that you can have people feel when they walk in the meeting, wow! This is, I mean, something's going to be different here. This is not Debbie Downerland. This is really going to be, this could be a strong organization. I'm going to take this seriously. I'm glad I paid dues already. I'm going to have to stand in line and do it now. If you think about it, you only, these, these visits, you only have so much time in the doors, right? You have 2,000 doors. You can't be, you know, spend half hour with everybody, can you? So how do you structure what you have to say so that you efficiently get the job done? Let me suggest four things that you need to make sure are part of the core exchange in your organizing practice. And many of you have already touched on these points. The first is just the introduction. Who are you? What are you doing at my door? I mean, that's a natural question, right? Well, what is this organization? So, you know, I'm Wade Rathke. I'm an organizer for Acorn International. We're talking to people all throughout the neighborhood. Here's my buddy, you know, a neighborhood resident. And a lot of people are talking about building a community organization here as part of Acorn. And we're having so, you're introducing yourself, who you are, what it's about. The second piece is just an explanation. That's how you start moving people into understanding the organization. This community organization is going to be a little different. It's going to be membership based. We're going to elect leaders at the first meeting. We're going to talk about issues. We're going to make a decision about campaigns. There's going to be a decision about the first action that we make at that first meeting. This, this organization is based on membership. You can pay dues. Here's what the dues are. You have to be transparent. Don't sneak up on them and say, oh. Hey, I'm glad you said yes. Let me tell you about the dues. Okay. You know? Oh, did I tell you about the dues? Let me tell you about the amount now. No, you gotta, you know. The dues, hey, the dues are very reasonable. The dues are $10 a month, 10 pounds a month, whatever it might be that it is. And we're encouraging people to join now. One of the things y'all would like that, I mean, no matter where I've been in the world, no matter what neighborhood in the United States, we have never been an Acorn member there. As part of the draft, we all say, hey, we're organizing an Acorn. You've heard of Acorn? You know, almost everybody, everywhere in the world will look at me in the eye and say, you know what, yeah, yeah, I've heard of Acorn. Because they, they want to believe they've heard an organization that's going to make a difference. They may not be, I'm not really clear about it because it's not on TV or whatever. Well, how could they have seen it in advance and it's on TV? The point is, people in our community want to believe that this kind of organization is possible. You're basically helping facilitate what they want to believe that someday in their lives there'll be an organization they can be part of, they can help lead, that will really fight and make a difference. So, yeah, they may not know the name, the name may be the one you're saying now, but so introduction, explanation, and then you have engagement. And that's when you're listening and talking with people about issues. Now, you're not going in there taking a survey, you're not a pollster, you're not working for the government. In fact, in a huge number of cases where we do join, I think we have to first prove as part of the explanation we're not part of the government. <coughs> we're not an insurance agent. We're not selling anything. This is what we do. That's part of why, you know, having somebody with you and doing this rap is so important. In the engagement, you're talking about how to hear. Now, when you first ask people, what are your issues in the neighborhood? You know, 
nine out of ten times that people tell you? Got no issues. Oh, my issues. Issues? What's? I don't know. Hey, no problem. No problem. Hey, man, no issues. And so a lot of people, I mean, you say to them, hey, you know, any problems in the neighborhood? Any issues you're worried about? Not that I can think of. So that's testing again, because it's not like people don't have issues. They all have a mountain load of issues. It's just people want to know any issues. What is an issue? I mean, we may know in the language of organizing that an issue is something, you know, like a bedroom tax or like, you know, loose dogs or, you know, bad garbage pickup or whatever, but it's not necessarily you're sitting in the house on the other side of the exchange, you're going to jump out to loose dogs. I mean, why would you think loose dogs is even an issue? So we always say a lot of, you know, after we ask about the issues, we have a lot of people in the neighborhood are talking about A, B, and C. I don't know if these are issues for you, or there may be other issues that are more important to you, but you basically move the discussion to, from the general to something more specific so that people who aren't sitting in the huge grievance can respond as part of this dialectical process. Yeah, you know, like, this dog suck. I don't like, I don't like this dog. People may think I'm trivializing, but if you ever can figure out, now I have not been able to in all my years of organizing, how to deal with three issues. Loose dogs, bad garbage pickup, and, and terrible drainage. You basically can organize enough power to the world. <laughs> I know that's not how you want to see the issues, but those three things resonate everywhere in the world. I don't care if um, you know, the fanciest cities in, in uh, the UK or the United States or Canada to the largest slums in the world. It's all those three things, you're, you're halfway there, or more. But the point is, so people are talking about the bedroom tax, and some of you are saying, hey, there's a lot of people talking about the bedroom tax. What, what's, what's, how do you feel about that? What's your, well, you'll hear. Are there other issues? So once you get people, it's a, we're talking about engagement. Once you get people engaged and they're talking and you're listening, it almost matters not at all what you're saying anymore. It only matters what they're saying. And that's the point of this day to day, this, this door knocking exchange, is to get people talking so that they will tell you what they're really thinking, what their issues are, and then you can move them into the next stage, the fourth stage, which is commitment. And you're trying to get them to commit on a number of levels, but they'll become a member. And we always, and, and the model I'm familiar with, we always ask people right then to join the organization. I know this seems totally asked to people. Well, why would we join an organization? The organization hasn't had a meeting. Why would we pay you? They haven't seen the organization level. They haven't seen what you can do for them. What you can do for them? <laughs> it's all what them can do for them. We don't do anything for them. They pay dues to the organization. We have succeeded in convincing them already, based on their own words to us, that they want and need an organization. If you want and need an organization, you're probably willing to join now, aren't you? You know what? We sign up a lot of members on the door for the first time. We see them. First time they've ever heard of it before. First time they're organizing the group. Because people, once again, this is not sales. This is really what people want. You can't get people to do something they don't want to do. None of you are good enough. I'm not good enough. So a lot of people join. Generally, in a group, in, a, in hitting 2,000 doors, uh, predictably, you'll have 150 to 200 people that join before the first meeting. Not all the people that join will be at the first meeting. Some people who will be at the first meeting will never join. We actually get people to join and then talk to them about coming to the meeting. We always take nothing but a yes. They don't join, we keep moving. And you come to the meeting. Here's when the meeting is, you need to run, whatever. But you always leave with a yes, never with a no. And that's the stage of commitment. So, and then no matter what people say, you come to me or not, as an organizer, you obviously rate the, the prospects of whether or not they're a yes, no, maybe, or whatever the system is. In political, uh, political turnout, we do a five point system. Um, in union elections, we do a three to five. And basic door knocking, a three point system is fine. No, yes, maybe. You're always no's, don't worry about it. I never waste your time on them, no. Part of the reason you're door knocking is to bring some people in the organization and some people to keep out of the organization. Once again, I know that's a sad 
sounds contrary to what you normally believe, but it really doesn't help you if you have 200, 250, 300 people in a meeting to have really done the job to get that drunk to the meeting. So if you're going out with somebody who's, you know, three sheets to the wind and you're, you know, hearing all their crazy theories after they're, you know, two or three pints down, down, you don't necessarily want to make a big point of them coming to the meeting because the odds are they're going to stand up in the back and, you know, who knows what's going to happen. So if you want to be a liberal, join that part. If you want to be an organizer, you have to make decisions about how to build your organization. So you're looking for who you really want in, and for those people who are just whack out there, you're getting out of that door. So you make an assessment no matter what people are saying. Um, the maybes and yeses, you're on like, you know, white on rice. Uh, you're all over that, between that point of the door knocking, you're doing reminder phone calls, you're in the organizing committee, you second business with people who are potential leaders. Those people who are potential leaders, you're invited to join the organizing committee so that the organizing committee grows and expands. You're invited to take the role. You have to be always clear that part of what you're doing in the structure of the is also training leadership because the odds that organizing committee members will be elected to the first group of officers in that group are huge. Because who will everybody have seen? You will have seen people out on the doors working. So it's a sweat equity system. They will have seen people work hard. They aren't necessarily the most charismatic. They aren't necessarily people who give the best speech. They aren't necessarily somebody who will follow the barricades, but they've seen that person <coughs> in their doors all throughout the neighborhood wearing a t-shirt, putting up posters, handing out flyers, on the phone, calling their mining meetings. Who are they going to vote for in the office? I mean, is there a mystery to democracy? Not really, but it's based on the work of the organizing class. It's almost a surprise when somebody who's not on the organizing committee gets elected. But we always, in our groups, did temporary officers, regardless for the first several months so that once the experience of actually taking action on the campaigns happened, the membership had a chance to determine whether or not the people they just met were, should have full terms. I don't want to get too much in the weeds because we're, you know, we're now we're in the esoterics of organizing well in the model. Everybody can make good decisions, but, you know, sometimes people spring up in a meeting, they get elected, and then they have first action. They're afraid to walk into a city council chamber. Well, you know, you can't, if that person has a two-year term, that organization's got trouble. So they need to have a way in which people can have a graceful exit from leadership or see people who rose to the campaign and the actions and whatever and have them rewarded with more stable leadership position. Nine out of ten times, the temporary leaders become the permanent leaders. But you got your job as an organizer, my job as an organizer, is basically going to protect the growth of the organization. So you're not able to be Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm and just assume everything's going to come out great. You have to actually organize in the premise that everything could go really bad. So you better be on top of building the infrastructure that makes sure that it doesn't get that bad. <coughs> okay, so door knocking, what are the four elements? Introduction. Explanation. Explanation. <coughs> Engagement. Commitment. You know, you get through life remembering those things about door knocking. I don't care if you're an organizer or not. That's probably a good thing. You know, it'll help you in a lot of the changes you have to have your conversation. Say, you meet somebody for the first time, give it a mind. Got to create a happening. Obviously, the more you're in touch with people, <coughs> what happens at this first meeting you right now? You've already heard in some ways, right? You walk in, and you're signing a list. If you haven't joined, you're going to be Go to a membership table and be asked to join. What's, what do you, there's an election obviously, like I said, people, you know, the first officer will get elected, but how do you make a decision on the issues? You have all these issues you've been hearing about for weeks on the doors. How do you decide what's the first campaign and what's the first action? Asking. That's my guy here. Asking, yes, you will ask. But what's the process? Would you get something like, like narrow it down a bit, though? Like, it's a little confused. 
So you want to be realistic within the expectations of the organization to scale and grow, but you also want to make sure that you're committed and the organization will be committed to doing everything it can to win that first campaign. It's very difficult to build a powerful long-term organization if you lose the first campaign. As you can imagine. How many of you have uh, personal experiences with being part of an organization? All of you? Say all. So, what's your experience with women? By a show of hands. Well, the only issue for our 
our chair away from the news. <laughs> okay, other depressing stories? <laughs> Okay, well, other stories? Well, it's kind of in the middle. I guess like the, the, the F has the Edinburgh Prime Minister's Action Group, who have had quite good wins um, mm -hmm. over the tendency fees and criminal laws. It's been, and for us in the group, it felt like, I think it felt really good, but at the same time, because the organisation is in the broad base, like, because there's not so, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people in it, I don't think it's felt like that kind of elation that's passed on. Like, you know, there have been wins that have come through. I guess lobbying and publicity type campaigning rather than this kind of mass movement type stuff. And, and it, like the wind still feels good, but I feel like it's still, it still looks like a quality to be like different. Well, you should learn to be happier with women. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. really, as you can see from your brothers and sisters, it's more rare than you think, so you shouldn't be so picky. When it comes along, take it, you know? Other experiences, yeah? You must be one like.
many groups in the U.S. now and in other countries of 30 odd people like you are. How many people have no experience with organizations anymore? So a lot of people are slackers, you know, they don't mind pressing the like on Facebook or signing an internet petition or, you know, signing somebody's petition on the street corner or whatever. But that's, that's a light lift, right? I mean, this is what there's an elevator. I mean, that's, that's no heavy lifting to do that. That's, uh, Slacktivism in my, in my terms. So, but they don't have as much organizational experience as they once did. And this is part of the problem of what, what generation we organize as opposed to, you know, people 50 years ago who had vibrant experience in with the labor unions or were active in their church or uh, civic organizations or veterans. I mean, uh, this whole theory that. Uh, a guy named Robert Putnam argues, and a lot of it is, is wrong when you actually read the books, but there's a, a whole concept called bowling alone. Anybody hear about this? Anybody ever have to take sociology or whatever? Well, his point, reduced to a nutshell, is that there's this phenomenon in the U.S. that uh, more people were bowling, but bowling leagues were dying. So people were no longer joining leagues and going to bowl every Wednesday night with their, with their buddies, but they were bowling more, but they were bowling alone, just paying for the lane, maybe going with a buddy on, but no teams, no. And his whole point became, and the larger study was the weakness of organizational life, and you can't deny that. Maybe you can in the UK, but you can't in the rest of the world. Labor density has fallen like a rock in our generation. I mean, I don't think we're good organizers, but then, the numbers actually prove how humble we need to be. So labor membership is falling, maybe not in the UK, I don't know, certainly in the rest of the world. Membership in churches, who goes to church anymore? Well, some people do, the elderly, God love them. Um, membership is falling, those are the facts. That's why you have a folk now in Argentina and other places, I mean, they don't have any membership. You know, in whole parts of the world now, compared to they have a conversion. And you can just go through the list. Boy Scouts, I mean, any major mass organization, uh, veterans groups, membership is down. People just have less organizational experience. Well, if they have less organizational experience, they also have less of a way to empathize in their own experience what to expect from an organization. And for those of you who might think about being an organizer, it's actually important. If you've had a experience being part of a local group, it actually tells you something about how you would want to be treated as a member. Never a member of anything. I've never even been a low-level leader. It's it's not that you can't learn it. I'm sure you're all bright, smart people. But it's harder if you've never had an experience that helps you translate what you're trying to do to where, where you've been yourself. Does that make any sense to anybody? So it used to be, and I, you know, when I started out as an organizer in the late 60s, you could talk to people about where they in the council or where they Scouts or Girl Scouts, or were they active in their church, or were they sing in the choir? Well, you wouldn't bother with those conversations today in the United States. I mean, you'd be talking to yourself. They say, oh, God, are you old as dirt or what? <laughs> you know, this is not, I mean, Facebook, I mean, yeah, I can organize. I, I put a meeting together with Facebook. Wow. How do you do that? And they actually, the whole, I had some, I had someone the other day, and, uh, was asking me about raising money. He said all their experience with raising money was based on social network. Was there any other way to do that? Well, you can imagine how difficult it would be to have a conversation about door knocking with this person. And well, you know, you take your computer to the door, you know, your, your laptop or your I, iPad or whatever, and you say, you like this uh, organization? I, mean, I, I can't even imagine how to have a conversation. But uh, she's not here in this room, so we don't have to have that conversation. Luckily, for all uh, you know, losing experience than we seem to have had, you have had some experience in the head nodding with being part of an organization, big, smaller, and different. And that's something to build on. And I think it's part of what my argument would be in looking at at least how ACORN is organized in the past, that the role for members, the role for leaders, and a practical, pragmatic way in which you're looking at the selection of issues. You're taking that from the by and by, and you know, we'll all have
that freedom someday to something very specific and very immediate and very realizable that everybody would understand if you win that it makes a difference. Which is part of your point, right? About uh, that umbrella the tennis association. And sometimes people don't have to have experienced that if you do a good enough job communicating, as you were arguing earlier, what the victory was and why it was important to people and why it was important to everybody and how everybody could take advantage of it. So, if we were back in Newark with those uh, ladies in the welfare rights group and they had taken that school clothing, they had taken the victory when they had it in their hand, even though there were only 200 of them then, it may have been more possible for them to go back and talk to the other 30,000 people that were on AFTC at that time about how they could also win school clothing for children join the organization and potentially put more pressure on that welfare system to raise the level of benefits. Maybe it wouldn't have been adequate income now, but it might have been a whole lot different organizational story we were telling than this sort of, you know, tragic comic affair of them going for the barricades there and walking away yeah, with nothing. So, in looking at how the ACORN model works, you can come out of this with a consensus on the issues. Maybe the top two or three issues, but you would come up with a decision coming out of that meeting based on a vote of what issue the group's going to do first and when that action is going to be. And that first action would be hopefully within a very short period of time, but certainly no more than one to two weeks. You can't have people coming out of the, the high of excitement, the exhilaration of meeting, and then not knowing when they're going to take action to actually put that in, to implement that decision and see what it is in. And then you go forward. And if, you did, if everybody did the right thing, and you just hang in there until you won. It might take a while, depending on how good the issues are, how good the folks are, and how you do a good job of them cleaning up. You take everybody who came to the meeting, move forward that everybody who didn't come to the meeting, you still have that whole list of yeses and maybes. You didn't get back to every one of those people, and the fact that they didn't come to the meeting, you interpret as, you never say, hey, dude, you're coming to the meeting. Where were you? Would that get him to the next meeting? That's amazing how many times people say that. Hey, man, I thought you told me you were coming to the next meeting. You weren't there. Where were you? Bus run over you? You know, dog in a dog eat your homework, what happened? No, you're a man, you missed a great meeting. Huh? You're not gonna believe the next one because this meeting was blah blah blah, here's what happened. And I don't ever give him a chance to talk about why his lame ass went to the meeting. Because once again, my point is I want him, he had originally said yes, I want to keep his commitment that I thought I had at the doors or whatever that was. I want to keep that evergreen until I get it. Remember, you know, Fred Ross three times on Cesar Chavez's door until he got him, right? I want to get him and every other yes, and maybe that's what I'm going to go back to someday. Because the whole point is from whatever that 200 is, there are 2,000 households. You know, where I'm trying to build up in a series of steps is in, in an ideal organizing drive. Within a year, I want there to be 40 to 50 percent of that neighborhood actually as members. Now, does that happen all the time? No. People end up, you know, the organizer servicing five or six groups that servicing, she's servicing, you know, 10,000 households and 1,000 members. And eventually, you can't do all the work. Maybe the organizer may want to do that, blah, 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 blah. But, is it possible? Yes. We've many times organized 20, 30, even more than 50 percent dues paying membership of that community. Is that group stronger? Sure, it's stronger. But the facts are because everybody else is so weak, if you only have 10 percent membership, you're still stronger than everybody else. And in the same way I said the expectation of your own members and leaders are to lose, believe me, the expectation of the targets is that you're going to be a candy ass. That's, that's, that's a, another American expression. You can't be a uh, their, their expressions you're going to fold. That you'll show up, you'll have your little sign, you'll have your little petition, you'll talk to some newspaper reporter, you'll put it on uh, your website, and you'll go home and I'll never hear from your hands again. And the truth is, their expectation is usually right. I mean, most people, they don't win that first day. I mean, we're going to go into campaigns all afternoon, but it's amazing how important just plain old percentage.
persistence is. Just not being willing to say you lost. How is your organization dealing with coming uh, forward attitude or what's the point? Um, How's it doing what now? Uh, how do you handle uh, apathy? How, how do you handle all oh, what's the point in where the politician always bring, they always lie, where it may be believe one thing, maybe you need to believe that at that time. But I have a plan, three years time, ten years time, that's what you What is the point? Like, how, how do you handle this, this attitude? Well, we argue based on our experience is different, that we can't make a difference. But once again, I'm not organizing 100% of the people. I'm organizing, and I represent, and I service that membership, those people who decide, in fact, they can do something. So that person who wants to tell me, you know, every, you know, depressing experience they have and why it's not possible, this may not, and I'll tell them, this may not be the organization for you. <laughs> you may just want to, I mean, I'll challenge you. You may just want to sit at your house. You may just want to read about this in the paper, you know. I'll bet you if something happens good, maybe you'll change your mind, you'll come to an organization, but hey, don't let me talk into it. This is your organization. If you think we're a bunch of losers, if you think you're a bunch of losers, darling. Hey, lucky with your life. Well, 